Welcome to week three, Managerial Finance, summer 2014. Um, we're going to talk about, continue on, about financial statement analysis. But I want to back up a little bit and go back to why do we look at financial reports? Why do we do financial analysis? First, if you're within the company, it's to understand the company, to be able to make decisions. So you look at information in order to take action. We can use it for developing plans. That can be a strategic plan, which is a long-term objective, or an operating plan, which is the next year. But you need to understand what's going on to go forward. You can use it to set goals. <clears throat> now, remember, there's a difference between goal setting and planning. Planning is at a business level. Goals, can you can drive that down to an individual level. And you want to make sure that you have goals that are obtainable and realistic, but you need to tie the goals in with the plan. You use it to evaluate profitability of a business. Not just the total business, but to evaluate the business component. When I worked for HSBC Bank, I had two roles at different times. One was to evaluate the profitability of the entire organization. But then I had the responsibility for determining profitability by business units. Some of the business were geographic, some of it were by product. So we had businesses across New York, the Western region, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, New York City. So we actually had to develop plan, plans and goals by each of those business units. And then we evaluated the profitability. Now, that's used to evaluate management. Was I, as that officer in charge of that business here in Rochester, how was I doing? Was I achieving what I needed to do? Do you want to sell the business or do you want to expand your business. And those are decisions that you make based on profitability, which requires you to really have an understanding of what's going on on a detailed basis. To make pricing decisions. How are we going to price a product or a service? We can use it to identify opportunities for improvement. So if we're seeing things happen that we don't like to see, it might help us understand what can we do better. And then it determines our funding needs. How much cash do we need to operate the company? And then determine appropriate capital structure. Capital structure is the mix of debt and equity that we use. So really, this internal is a very important thing. And if we're going back, this is managerial finance. So we're looking at it from these two perspectives. What is done internally? So some of the things that we've already been working on, the project one, um, project two, cash flow, these are all things that are important to the day-to-day -day running of a business. Now, when we look at it, there can be external users. A lender, a lender is going to look at the company in order to make a decision whether to lend money and then if they are going to lend money, what terms and conditions will they lend money? And they have to make sure they understand the business enough because they have to be assured that based on where the company is, what their profit has been, and where their profit is going, that they're going to be able to repay that debt. So think about this. That's going to be from the free cash flow. So if you're not being able to generate enough free cash flow, to pay back the investors, you're not going to have sufficient coverage. The lender may not make the decision to lend because a lender wants to get paid back. Okay, Lenders, as we'll see as we go forward, uh, they don't care about the collateral. They just want the ability to safely repay the debt. Okay, They don't want to get to the end of the month and figure out how the company is going to pay it. So you got to be spot on with that. Um, then there's analysts. And these are analysts that are working for investment firms, working for mutual funds, working for exchange traded funds, uh, pension plans, uh, the hedge funds, etc. 
and they're looking at the company to make some decisions. Okay, so that becomes an important thing. Now we'll take a little bit more about what analysts do, both from a supply side and a buy side, but that's not where we are right now. So we'll get to that. But the analysts have a lot of different roles, and these are roles that are filled by graduates in accounting, a business with a concentration in finance. And yes, you can learn enough finance at here at Genesea, Geneseo to be able to be an analyst. Okay, for those of you that are involved in the Smith Student Management Investment Funds, you are doing some of this analysis today. What you're learning in this course will make you a better analyst for Smith. If you are interested in that, and you are not part of Smith, uh, you are welcome to join that group in the fall. And we also will have a competition called the Adirondack Cup. And that is a competition among 18 schools in New York. Um, and last year, Geneseo finished fifth out of 18, which is very good. We beat our index uh, in a very strong performance. Uh, and that's a group of folks who look at this and, and this analysis is part of what they do. So if you'd like to join us, you are welcome uh, to do that. So we actually apply that. Uh, the media looks at this and they, you know, what's it mean to the community? Will there be jobs lost? Will it be good for the community? Uh, and the media does report on financial results. Uh, the investor. Uh, if you are making an investment in the company, and say as an equity investor, either a large player or for your own account, you need to understand what's happening because you're putting money on that. You're investing in a company with the hope of generating a return. Okay, And that return is going to come from dividends that are paid, increase in the stock value and increase in the stock value is going to come about because the company is doing well and growing since the price of a stock is based on the underlying cash flow of the company over a long period of time you need to understand that in order to determine an appropriate investment for yourself based on your needs and desires and your goals but also will it obtain it so you're going to have to look at some companies and say based on what they have done and what they'd like to do, is it possible or probable that they will achieve it? Those investors are helped by analysts, but this becomes an important thing because you don't want to just jump in on a stock without knowing about it. You need to understand it, evaluate its valuation today and where it could be. The other external viewer is an acquirer somebody wanting to acquire the company. Now, this has been in the Wall Street Journal and I'm sure you've been reading this, yeah, is you have a couple of food companies going at it now. Pilgrim's Pride and Tyson are arguing over hillside foods. That's really cool and that's driving it up, but they have to see value there. So the, they're seeing value. They're seeing value differently, and that's the purpose of analysis. You make a certain set of assumptions, and then you go from there. So that's why you, the, this is the two views that you're looking at. Now, when I'm looking at a company from a financial analysis point of view, I take a holistic point of view. I don't just look at it that we look at one thing and that becomes all. A be all and end all. It's a mix of everything. You got quantitative information, you got qualitative information, you got historical information, you have future information, and you have a set of assumptions that you make about the broad economy, okay, about consumer preferences, about consumer desires. I start with fundamentals. Okay, those are the basics of the company where we're just looking at the numbers. Okay, we got to start there. Then we go deeper. But it's not just this numbers or formula. Okay, I, I can teach you, you know, I can say, here's worksheets, go put the numbers in, and the numbers are what they are. But it's important for you to be able to 
look at that and evaluate it to understand what's going on. It gives us an opportunity to look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Where is the company going? Remember, the, fu the, price of, the future price of the equity, what it would go to, is based on where the company is going, which is a function of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. So where is the company going? Are they going up? Are they going down? What are the historical results telling us relative to the future? If somebody has grown at 10% a year historically, and they're telling us they're going to grow in the future by 50%, we need to understand why. You don't all of a sudden in a business going that you're selling at 10% growth and now you're going to go to 50 without a very specific business plan. What's the market? What's the potential? Is it a new product? What are you doing differently? So this is about the financial analysis of a company as it comes together. Now, what are the projected results telling us? Is it going to tell us there's going to be more value, less value? Now, so that's sort of a rip. I want to go back and review that so you can be focused on that a little more, especially after we've gone through application project one and two. Uh, and this is a review. Where do you get information? Company website, first place. Financial websites. The library has a lot of information on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And when we go to the company's website, we can find financial data in the form of regulatory reports, the 10K, the 10Q, S1, the proxy, but they also have investor presentations, which I really want you to take a look at as we move forward here. That helps us interpret what it is we're seeing. There's financial websites. You might want to sign up. It's free. Morningstar. Dot com, and you'll be able to get in and see Morningstar reports. You use the Wall Street Journal to get reports. You can use MarketWatch, which is part of the Wall Street Journal site. So there's a lot of information, and you have to look around to get the right information that you need. It's not there, but everybody looks at things a little differently. But this is where are you going to get to the meat of the issue. Now, in the world of financial analytics, an analyst report, and these are people who follow companies, we'll continue to talk about this, but their report covers a couple of things. A summary data, what's the key factors and recommendation? There's usually a stock price chart. They do a summary of the business. They highlight financial highlights, and then they talk about investment rationale and risks. Then they go through key financial metrics and financial summary, and that's the basis for making the recommendation that they do up here. Okay, So where we've started out, right here, the key financial metrics and financial summary, that is the step that we're working on. I started pushing you a little bit to hear the rationale and the risks and the highlights and the summary so that we can understand it. But this forms the basis of our recommendation of an analyst. But the same concept applies when you're working within the company, within the CFO's office, within the treasurer's office, the financial planning office, the controller's office, uh, the treasurer's, the risk management. This is all related to that. You can't touch a business without getting into this. And if you're not necessarily wanting to go into finance and you're going into another field, you need to have an understanding of that. Because if you're running a business, you're going to be evaluated personally and your business. They're going to allocate capital to you based on these numbers. So if you're going to be into the field of marketing, you want to manage a business, you want to lead a business, these are tools that you will use. Now. Uh, interesting. Um, financial analysis is about critical thinking and analysis. It's really about thinking and analyzing. It's not just about putting numbers on a piece of paper. That, that's, that's a waste of anybody's time. 
but it's what does it mean? What is going deeper? And as you've seen on application project one, I've been pushing you to go deeper. I've been pushing you to go deeper, to develop a logical analysis, okay? I'm pushing you to be able to ask questions and drill deeper until you've uncovered what's really going on. Superficial at 30,000 feet doesn't help anybody. And then in the same vein, when you're doing any analytics, okay, it doesn't matter what it is, presentation and communication of your analysis is critical. Readers need to digest things quickly. So you need to have enough information there to be able to give them confidence, but you need to present it in a clear way. Hence my discussion of adding tables, putting some quantified data around there. And I want to come back again. This type of work that you're doing results in financial decisions being made. So it could be to expand a business, sell a business, discontinue a business, make an investment, not make an investment. So you got to be thorough and understand things in order to make a fi good financial decision. If you don't make a good financial decision, you could end up in some deep trouble. I'm going to continue to be very interactive with you. I'm going to read everything you write and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to push. Okay, because the value, I think, is for you learning how to analyze. I can't talk you into analysis. Okay, I can't give you a lecture that all of a sudden you're going to have all these great things. I can provide a structure, but I see the value of the online course this summer is our ability to interact and for you to learn. So take that, and that's the intro to what we're going to talk this. When we're doing our analysis, we start with fundamentals. That often entails taking advantage and looking at ratios. And the purpose of ratio analysis is to help us better understand the firm and identify its strengths and weaknesses. It is only meaningful within the context of the company's business cycle. Okay? You can't look at a standard number and say, that's the right number. Okay, It's only within that company's business cycle. We'll look at that as we go forward. Next, trends are more important than an individual ratio. Okay, Taking a point in time doesn't tell us whether something is getting better or it's getting worse. That's why I ask you to look at three years of cash flow in application project two so that you can see what the trend is. Is it getting better? Is it staying the same? Or is it getting worse? So that becomes meaningful. Looking at competitors and in industry average is also helpful to determine if they're in line or if they are different. Outliers can be dangerous. Ratios are intended to really be able to better focus us in on what areas need further investigating. They can be red flags, they can be green flags, but we need to understand them. Each of the ratios we're going to take time and look at today uh, are the basics. Some of you may already know these, and I'm going to walk you through them first uh, through this discussion. Then I'm going to walk through Geneseo Coffee Company, and then I will walk through a sample company. So let's start with one of the first things, and that is liquidity. Liquidity, when you look at it, actually talks about what kind of cash is available. Okay, If you have all your assets of a business or your personal life in cash, it can be said that you're very liquid. Now, if you're very liquid, you can't make any money. So liquid assets, cash, is great to have and you need it, but it isn't always a productive way to make money. Okay, So we can say that with a liquidity ratio, that those are assets that are easily converted into cash. Okay, uh, 
they can include. We and then we need to look at these within the context again of the working capital cycle. There we go. For example, accounts receivable. If your accounts receivable are collected in 30 days, they can be readily converted into cash. Inventory has different components, as you know. It can be raw materials. In the case of Geneseo Coffee Company, it could just be the coffee beans. It can be work in process, those beans that are in the roaster. And then there's the finished product, the beans that have been roasted and packaged. Each one of them can be liquidated, but at different values and different times. The inventory that's in the bags can be sold much faster than the raw materials. And since you're adding value, at a higher price. So you need to look at this liquidity within the time of the working capital cycle and the cash conversion cycle. Okay, Because as you're seeing, some of these cycles are long. Some of them are very, very short, 20, 30 days. Others of them, you're out there two, 300 days. So we need to look at liquidity within that concept. The most common one that everybody talks about, and that's the current ratio. Current assets, right here, divided by current liabilities. Okay, it comes right off your balance sheet. The word current assets is used and current liabilities in most companies. What you may find though, is that in other companies who don't have a segregated balance sheet, they just list asset and liabilities. If you don't see the word current assets and current liabilities, you have to go back and compute it yourself. And since you know the working capital cycle, you know it would be cash, you know it would be accounts receivable, it would be inventory and prepaid expenses. So those are the four things that you would then put into current assets when the balance sheet isn't laid out that way. Current liabilities, that would include accounts payable, accrued expenses, sales tax payable, any payables of that nature. So that's current liabilities. Now yes, why wouldn't a company have that? Well, banks don't have it because all of their assets, their, their nature of their business is different. You will find in some airline companies that you're looking at that they don't have that. So you're going to actually have to go back and look at that, compute the number. So if it's not on your balance sheet, you need to figure it out based on your knowledge of the working capital cycle, which is application project two. Now, a, if we're looking at this from a traditional perspective, is a current ratio greater than one would say if they liquidated all their assets, then they could pay the liability off of everything in the coming up year. Now, that is a intellectual argument, and it, it's true, surely, that if you could liquidate those assets, you could pay off everything, given that it's positive, greater than one, that you should be able to pay off your debts within a year. Now, you gotta think about this for a second. Wait a minute, we're going concern. We're not gonna sell our assets to pay off our debts, okay? So you got to go deeper into that and say, how will that affect their cash flow? Okay, If the current ratio is less than one, meaning they don't have sufficient assets to cover the liabilities within a year, it may be indicative that they may not be able to grow. They may not have sufficient working capital. Okay, If it's greater than one, that means they have a cushion, or perhaps there is more room for working capital growth. The other liquidity ratio that we're looking at is the cash conversion cycle, which you already looked at. Okay, you, you measured that, you looked at it for your company. So that what you were doing was looking at liquidity of the firm. Let's now move on to asset efficiency ratios, and that measures how efficiently the firm is managing its assets. And it can help us 
understand the question or to get a handle around this question, does the amount of each asset type seem reasonable? Is it too high or too low in view of current and projected sales? So when we're looking at these efficiency ratings ratios, we really are looking at how assets are used in a company. And again, this keeps relating back to the working capital cycle. If a company has too many assets relative to its working capital cycle, then it's depressing earnings because those assets aren't effectively being deployed to generate revenue. If a company doesn't have enough assets relative to the working capital cycle, it could be missing sales. Okay, so if you don't have enough working capital to put into receivables and inventory, then you're missing sales. But on the other hand, if you have too many, you're depressing earnings because you're not using that. So when we look at these asset efficiency ratios, you've already done an important part of it. And I started out specifically talking about cash flow before you get taught up in ratios because it goes deeper. Okay. Um, it's a good measurement to cash conversion, which you've worked on, and I'm reviewing this. It hits, it, it brings together how things interrelate to each other, and they're not independent of each other. You can't just look at accounts receivable and say good, bad, yes, no. You've got to look at that relationship, and you need to have some independent measures to determine a qualitative benchmark. Is it good or bad? We might think it's good or bad but how does it compare to others? That will help us understand whether this is an industry problem or whether this is something with the individual. Some of you are looking at Dillard's and their sales were 1% year on year growth. Well, if their competitors have been growing at 10% and they've only grown at once, something's not right within the company. But if we look at the competitors and all of the competitors are growing at that 1% rate, we may look at it as a macro event. But until we do the analytics and do detail, go deeper, we won't be able to do that. Then there's inventory turnover, and that's a variation of the conversion cycle that you've worked on, which is cost of goods sold divided by inventory. And that is really telling us how many times does inventory turn over. So in the case of Geneseo Coffee Company, do we have this situation that they're turning it over very fast? Now, since this is a food type business, we would expect a faster turnaround. Okay. Another one, return on assets. Net income divided by assets. That's measuring what return did we get on the assets that we deployed, okay? If we're not making a sufficient return on those assets, then perhaps we should look at other uses for those assets. We have return on equity, which is net income divided by average equity. How efficient are we using the equity that we have? This will come more into play when we do capital structure, uh, which I think we will do next instead of the five C's of, of credit, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so let's return on equity. Let's look at equity ratios themselves. Um, dividends, companies will pay out of earnings. The company, oh, let's, let's back up. A company has earnings. They can do two things with those earnings. One is they could keep them within the company. We call that retained earnings, retained profits, or we can pay them out as dividends. And the first thing we have there is the dividend yield. What is the dividend divided by the price per share? That's going to give our yield. That's simply what's paid on an annual basis versus the current price. That will tell us what the dividend yield is. Now the next one becomes important too because you can only pay dividends out of current year earnings or prior year earnings that you didn't distribute. 
and the payout ratio is total dividends divided by net income. What percentage of your earnings did you pay out? So if we're looking at this purely from a dividend perspective of a company, if they pay out, say, only 10% of what they make, there's some confidence that that 10% will stay because there's a cushion in there. And if the industry is, business is growing, they might be able to increase the dividend payout rate. Now, if you have somebody who's paying out 90% of their income in dividends, if income backs down, you're going to have a much harder time keeping up with that dividend. In fact, it most likely will come down. So that's a dividend equity ratio. We look at tangible equity. Now, this is, in, is, a, is a concept that it has its pros and cons. And what it is, is it assumes that certain assets, and from a financial accounting perspective, we have current assets, then we have fixed assets, which is our property, plant, and equipment, long-term receivables, long-term investments. But then we have intern, intangible assets. And the, these include such things as when you purchase a company, you may pay more than the value of the underlying assets. It's called goodwill. You may have bought a trademark. But these are assets that have value. Okay, The Kentucky Fried Chicken's secret recipe has value. The brand name of companies has value. But for looking at tangible equity, we take total equity less internal intangible assets. Now, we could also take a computation of looking at tangible equity to tangible assets. It's just another variation based on that. So there's some equity ratios. Let's look at some the debt management ratios. First one, leverage is to what extent the firm uses debt financing or financial leverage. We talked about the working capital cycle and you have to fund that working capital, provide for it somehow, and provide for your equipment that you need to produce whatever you're producing. So you have your choice at that point of using a mix of debt and equity. Okay, and We're going to talk about that in the next module that we work at. If a firm earns more on its assets than it's paying on its debt, then using debt levers, leverages, or magnifies the return on equity. Let's go through that again. If a firm earns more on its assets than it's paying on its debt, then that's leverage, which magnifies the return on equity. So if I'm making 10% on the assets that I have, and I borrow at a cost of 5%, I am making more money. That's leverage. Okay. By doing that, stockholders can control the firm with a limited amount of equity. Creditors look to the company that equity is to provide a margin of safety. Will I get paid back? The ability of the firm to absorb losses. So you sometimes have different perspectives. Shareholders might want 100% debt okay, because that really limits their risk and they can get a higher return. However, on the other side, the creditors don't always like to see that because that increases their risk. So it's about finding this medium. Okay? There's two types of measurements. The first is a measurement of actual leverage. What is the company's leverage? And that's the leverage ratio. And that's the long-term debt divided by equity, okay? And then there's the debt to assets. What's the long-term debt divided by the assets, okay? And then capital by percent. We look at what is long-term debt, preferred stock, common equity. 
So these are, when we actually look at the structure, capital structure, which is, is this, the debt to assets and the leverage ratio gives us a picture of how leveraged the firm is. And there's, when we start looking at this, there's advantages and disadvantages um, of this. If a firm has too much debt, that means they're going to be more susceptible to changes in sales on their profitability and their ability to repay debt. Okay, So it's what is the current situation? Next type is a valuation of the capacity to repay. Can the, Does the company have the ability to repay its debt? We look at two primary ways of doing that. The first is times interest earned, which is essentially saying, what's the coverage ratio for my interest? And it starts with EBIT, income before interest in taxes, divided by interest expense. That tells us how many times interest expense for the year is covered. So if you have a 20 to one coverage ratio, that means there's plenty of income coming off from the operations of the company to repay the interest expense. If it's one to one, you have a very close ability, a marginal impact of that company to pay debt. Now, what we've seen in the past couple of years, since 2008, we have seen companies improve this ratio dramatically. Uh, those businesses that have survived the Great Recession, what they've done is they've paid off debt. They're not growing as rapidly and haven't. So they've reduced the amount of debt they have. So we're seeing a lot of overall American business has very strong times interest earned, which is positioning them well for growth in the future. So we, we look, one, at the times interest earned. Next thing is cash flow coverage. How much cash is available to pay the interest expense and the current payment of principal that is due? And that is, we start with EBIT, income before interest in taxes, and then we adjust it, we add back depreciation and amortization because that's cash flow. Because remember, depreciation and amortization are non-cash expenses, but they are included through a reduction in earnings. So we add that back to get how much cash the company has available. It is similar to free cash flow, but traditionally it's it's calculated this way. And there's many ways. We look at things sometimes five different ways. And there's different formulas. Uh, you could probably find a formula for everything. But remember, this is intended to really give us an opportunity to look at where we are. And then we divide that EBITA, EBITDA, divided by what the interest expense is, which we get from up here. Okay. And then you add in the current portion of long-term debt, which is the amount that's payable in the coming up year. Again, the greater the number is, that means there's more cash available to pay debt, which makes it from a lender's perspective better. But from an internal perspective, you then say, good, we're, we're safe on that. But if you don't have enough cash flow there, you have to be aware of that and maybe consider other alternatives. So those are the debt management ratios. Let's look at profitability ratios next. A trend is most important. It, point in time is a point in time, but when we're looking at it over time, that's what's happening. One of them that I think is, is very important is sales growth. And it's always expressed as a percentage over the prior period. It can be year to year. Now that's what you've already done in application project number one. You looked at what the year-to-year -year growth is. Is a company growing? You can look at it from current quarter to prior quarter, which may make sense. But if we're looking at a retailer, this current quarter that we're looking at had has no major holiday. The prior quarter that most likely ended December 31st had the Christmas season. And when you look at the retail business, a huge amount of sales occur in the prior quarter. So you wouldn't necessarily want to look at it quarter to quarter in the retail business. You have to adapt this to the company and the industry you're looking at. Current quarter to same quarter last year takes into account those 
same quarter to quarter variation. So we can always look at what happened in the quarter ending December 31st for retail every year because we have the Christmas season every year. So that gives us a comparable one. We then can look at the compound annual growth rate for three or five years. How are they growing over time? I think sales growth is one of the biggest things to look at and we want to see a trend of it going positive. We don't necessarily want to see all this variation uh, that may be going on. That are very, you know, we would hope that we're having some cons nice consistent growth. Now, so that we look at net sales. Next as we come down is we look at the gross margin, which is net sales or revenue, less cost of goods sold or cost of revenue. Remember, sometimes different financial statements, some call it sales, some call it revenue, cost of goods sold, cost of revenue. It's the same thing. That equals the net margin. People may call it the net margin to gross margin. Whatever it is, after your sales less the cost of goods sold, it's expressed as a percentage. Now, this percentage becomes important because it helps you understand what's happening. So if sales are going up and the margin is staying the same, that is telling you that the relationship between cost and sales is the same thing. If it's getting bigger, the margin is getting bigger, you can assume that within that cost of goods, either you've got some scale, most likely, is scale driving this. You're spreading cost over a bigger one because you're buying more, you're getting a better price on product, and that can be positive. But if sales go up and the margin as a percent goes down, you need to ask, well, was it worth it to grow sales if we're not taking any more of that down? So that helps us evaluate the sales growth in connection with underlying costs. Evaluation of non-cost of goods sold. It's often expressed as a revenue. Um, what percentage of revenue goes into selling your product, running the company, your audit, your legal, your executive management team. So what's the percentage of that? We look at research and development costs. How much of revenue are we spending on R&D? Okay, you spend, you know, you want to look at this, how much you're spending, but also what is the outcome of that spending? What happens if you don't? And it helps us understand the others. So we got to look at that as a separate category for evaluation. We then look at our, continue on, is net income to revenue. How much of the revenue makes it to the bottom line? Okay, and that's very easily defined as net income divided by revenue. So when we're looking at it, we're having sales, and it has to drive something to the bottom line. The more that you can drive to the bottom line, the better. If you're only driving a little bit to the bottom line, you have to really look at that and say, why? What is it? The grocery business very is very thin margins, and that you're going to see a very low ratio here. Other businesses you're going to see that are very high. The next profitability ratio, and this is one that we've you've already looked at, uh, is earnings per share. How much did each share of stock earn? And it's a very simple formula: net income divided by number of outstanding shares. Net income comes from the income statement. Number of outstanding shares comes from either the balance sheet under the equity section. It will tell you how many shares are issued and outstanding. You will find it oftentimes in the statement of equity. You will find it in the notes to the financial statement. You will find it in financial summaries. So you, you simply take that earnings per share. Now, that is your basic primary earnings per share. Now, there's a concept called fully diluted earnings per share. And sometimes, because sometimes there's obligations, employee stock options, convertible preferred, that if exercise would increase the number of shares. And generally that's less than the earnings per share, the primary earnings per share. For purposes of this class, we're just gonna focus on earnings per share, primary earnings per share. We're not gonna get into fully diluted earnings if that's a very advanced topic. Um, pricing ratios, we've already started in. Price to earnings. Current price of stock, 
divided by earnings per share. And that can be expressed based on the past quarter or the past year. Then there is a, another PE that comes into play when we're looking at it within the marketplace, the financial markets, and that is the forward PE. What are the projected earnings? Okay, so you would say, if we're looking at how do you evaluate that, is the higher the PE, the more the market values the stock or sees growth continuing. And when you look at the historical PE, you're going to see a PE and then the forward. So that if you, you could find different gaps, okay? But the higher the PE, the more this values the stock or sees growth continuing or sees it continuing at a very advanced uh, rate. And then other price to ratios do exist. Now, okay, we do all that. Oh, back to other price ratios. That includes price to sales, price to book. There's a hundred of them out there. We're not going to worry about them right now. We're going to focus on the PE as being the primary thing. Okay, we do all of this stuff. Then what? Well, hopefully it indicates questions to ask. And hopefully by now you've seen me asking you a lot of questions about it. What I'd like you to do for project three is to ask, see if you can ask the question yourself before you submit it. Okay. Um, understand what's happening with the company. Understand the relationship <coughs> of revenue to profit. Apply that to the future. So this gives you our overview of financial statement analysis from a ratio perspective. What I'm going to go do now is I'm going to review Geneseo Coffee Company with you, and then I'll move on to my sample company. Then I will explain Project 3 to you. If you have any questions, please let me know.